Over the course of the 1940s and early 1950s, comic books featured many grim storylines filled with violence, gore, and suggestive content. Primetime comics would feature things like severed heads and men losing their flesh on the front cover. These were mostly the case in war and horror comics. Parents were outraged by these topics being presented to their children and encouraged mass comic burnings. One man noticed a change that needed to be made. That man's name is psychiatrist Frederick Wortham. Wortham ran a low-cost clinic for the less fortunate and underprivileged youth. He began noticing a pattern with the certain troublesome children who came in to see him, and that pattern was that most of them read comics. His main theory was that comics caused juvenile delinquency. When he gathered up enough data to prove his point, he recorded it all in his book, Seduction of the Innocent, from 1954. This eventually led to Wortham being involved in hearings and doing his best to publicly advertise the issue. As a result of the trials, the Comics Code Authority was created the same year. The code was happily accepted by parents around the country, although comic companies were not so welcoming. Some of the code's rules were so strict that it put comic companies out of business. The popular Mad Comics were forced to shut down production, but they eventually just rebranded themselves into the current Mad Magazine, which the code had no authority over since it was a magazine and no longer a comic. This also made major changes to superhero comics. They were no longer allowed to have any real violence and were not allowed to have the villain win by the end of the issue if the story wasn't going to be continued into the next issue. Authorities, such as police officers, were not to be displayed as anything less than the local heroes they are meant to be. It posed as a threat to Marvel Comics, who are famous for characters like Spider-Man, the Hulk, and the Fantastic Four. Marvel and the Code found themselves in an altercation in 1971 when Marvel wanted to run a new concept for a Spider-Man comic. The Department of Health, Education, and Welfare contacted then-editor-in-chief Stan Lee about an idea of running an anti-drug-themed Spider-Man story. Marvel was happy to do this and made the comic. The issue involves a friend of Spider-Man's on a rooftop after taking drugs. He walks off of the building, believing he can fly. Spidey swings in and saves him as he delivers an anti-drug slogan. After sending it to the Comics Code Authority to get approval, they declined. This is all because the issue simply mentions drugs. Marvel ended up going against the code and released the comic without the code's emblem on the cover. Rival company DC Comics, who is famous for characters such as the Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, and The Flash, was inspired by Marvel's actions. They discussed the process with Marvel and eventually made a similar crossover comic starring Green Arrow and the Green Lantern as they catch the Green Arrow's sidekick, Speedy, in the middle of heavy drug use. This comic was also made in 1971. Although, this issue was able to be released with the Code's approval, due to the Code's revision after the release of the anti-drug Spider-Man comic. How about we take Green Arrow, and we join him up with Green Lantern, and we send him off in a voyage across America? The two drive off in an old pickup truck to find America, and along the way, witness the country's problems. Fanatical religious groups, the union towns, the port system that's screwed up, the political system We that's got into up. a lot of territory, but then we were kind of running out of subjects. And I realized that we hadn't hit drug addiction. The Comics Code specifically forbade any conversation about drug addiction. So I did a cover. 
beady in the foreground, and he's got what's called the fixins for a heroin addict to shoot up. I went down the hall to an office of a, an editor named Julie Schwartz, and he went <coughs> like that. <laughs> what is this? I said, that's the cover we should be doing. So we can't do that. I said, but we should. He said, J -j -j you're out of your mind. You're out of your mind. Three months later, I'm visiting my friends over at Marvel Comics. I go and see Johnny Ramita. He shows me a Spider-Man page in which somebody pops some pills and walks off a roof. I said, did you send it to the code? Yeah, I sent it to the code, and they rejected it. The self-regulating Comics Code Authority that came about in the 50s is still in full swing, policing all publications to ensure they are morally sound. Stan said he'd like to run the book without the code seal. Really? Wow. I go back a couple of days later. Johnny, what's going on? He says, nothing. I said, what do you mean nothing? They didn't notice the seal wasn't on the book? No one in the country? No, we, know, we didn't get any letters or anything, nothing. They didn't notice the seal wasn't on the book. Okay, so oh what's going to happen? They're going to call a meeting of the Comic Code Authority. So they have a meeting like two days later, and they voted to change the Comics Code from top to bottom. Julie Schwartz comes down the hallway and says, we're going to do that book. Denny's writing this script now. <laughs> Within a couple of years, the Comics Code was gone. The code was revised numerous times after this. The code was defied many times after this and eventually led to the code no longer being relevant, with Archie Comics being the last to quit the code in 2011. Wortham's theory was never really proved to be true with the code's placement, but it did help shield America's youth from the horror stories and questionable content that filled the comic books before the code.